Okay, so um, pieces of chalk. Oh, there's a box here. Oh, there's a box, a small piece. Oh, there's a box with some large pieces, yes. Okay. So, the idea behind the construction is to think of the... Um, so, let's start the model. is to think of the, uh, the geometry as the product, or at least at your first pass at it, is to think of it as a product where uh, M is space-time, and I'm perhaps unfortunately going to have to think of space-time as a Euclidean manifold, so this is going to be a compact Euclidean signature, or Riemannian, let's just say Riemannian manifold. So in other words, the metric signature is four pluses. Um, and that's because the fields on this, then you can turn it into a Hilbert space and apply all of the theory that we've used so far. Now it is possible to construct uh, Lorentzian versions of this theory, uh, but it's far less developed, and I'm not going to go into that lecture. We're going to assume that there's, a, well, there is a strong connection between physics on uh, Euclidean space times, Euclidean signature space times, and Lorentzian space times. I mean, it goes by the name of Wick rotation and various other related things. Uh, so I'm going to assume we know how to do that. So that's this. And F is some sort of finite internal space. So it encapsulates all the fields at a point in space-time, and that has some sort of internal geometry. And it turns out, well, we know already that this uh, space-time, we know how to make that into a spectral triple, and it turns out that this finite internal space is also a spectral triple. Okay, and it's very similar to the Kaluza Klein uh, idea. I mean, Kaluza and Klein's idea was that the internal space should be a, another manifold, a little, little manifold at every point in space-time. There'll be a, be producting with another small internal space. And the first idea was this, it was a circle, and then you expanded in harmonics on the circle, and the lowest energy modes um, become fields on the space-time. Uh, or the fields on the space-time that we know, like you know, the gauge field and so on. Um, but, uh, so this is a sort of non-commutative version of that, of that Klutzer-Klein idea. Um, Lost something here. Yeah. So, um, so in the Kaluza Klein, you'd ha you'd write sort of um, you you'd write some um, metric uh, on the so the metric. So we have metric on M cross F, the whole thing. And then you have, you know, G mu nu uh, from mu and nu from one to four is the space-time manifold, is the space-time metric. And that's, that's the M. And then you have sort of G mu 5 
would be you know, like a of x would be a gauge field. And G55 is some sort of scalar. So X here is, is the point in space time, and then the dependence around F here, well, you have to sort of do some uh, harmonic expansion and think of the lowest mode, for example, a thing that's constant, doesn't depend on the fifth coordinate. And you get the space time fields, and then the higher modes, you, you have to sort of somehow argue away that they're, they're very high massive fields that the mass is too far, too, you know, too high for us to ever see. Like Planck scale or something, who knows. Um, so the Kaluza Klein idea is very popular, but it has various drawbacks because um, it doesn't quite produce the physics we know, uh, even if you replace F by a six manifold or something, which is very popular. Um, and also you have these higher modes which you don't know what to do with and you have to somehow argue away that there's an infinite tower of higher modes that we never see. Um, so in the non-commutative geometry uh, we're using an idea like this but it's a much better idea because our internal space uh, is finite in the sense that it has a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So finite dimensional. So the number of modes on, on the finite space in non-commutative geometry is finite. So there isn't an infinite tower of higher modes to argue away. They're just not there. Okay. And the other thing is that they come naturally non-commutative. And the non-commutativity codes in exactly the things like the gauge groups, which are non-commutative. And that's exactly the, the origin of that phenomenon. So it's, it's like Klutz or Klein, only much better. Okay. So, uh, firstly, I want to describe the internal space, this thing here, as a spectral triple. So that's that's what I want to describe now. Okay. <coughs> so this is the internal space. So firstly, there's an algebra, and it's the following thing. So it's an algebra over the real numbers, in fact. Uh, and I'm thinking of the complex numbers as a two-dimensional real algebra and also the three by three matrices over C as an 18 dimensional real algebra. And the quaternions we already know is, is a real algebra anyway, so that whole thing is a real algebra. So star is uh, the usual uh, complex conjugation on here and Hermitian conjugation here. And a typical element in here I'm going to write as a C, a Q, and an M in there. And obviously this, is, this has been chosen to look something like the, have something to do with the gauge group of the standard model. So there's uh, obviously some arbitrariness in this that one you know, why pick this algebra? Well, uh, it's something to do with the standard model. And in particular, you can have unitary elements in here. So I can have... Um, <coughs> uh, 
which satisfy uh, A star as A inverse. And then you can ask, well, what are the entry elements in this algebra? Um, well, in here, obviously, you'll have a U1. And the entry elements in the quaternions is SU2. And the entry elements in here is U3. So it's almost the gauge group of the standard model, but not quite. Okay. So now I'm going to use two representations of, <coughs> of the algebra. in C4. So pi 1 of A is... I'm going to think of all of these as complex matrices. So the Q, the quaternion, is a 2 by 2 complex matrix. So I can put that in here, Q, in a sort of 2 by 2 block. And then down here I'm going to put C0 naught C star. So that's the complex number, that part. So that's pi 1. And pi 2 is also a block matrix. You have the complex numbers in the top there, and then a 3 by 3 matrix M here. And obviously, 0 is here. So that's another 4x4 four four rep in the algebra. And these act on 4x4 uh, on four four matrices. Um, with uh, a left action... with pi 1. And this is matrix multiplication. Left, can't spell left. And uh, right multiplication by pi 2. That's the right action. So this is here as matrix multiplication. And I'm going to call this uh, a Hilbert space, so little h, curly h. So it's not yet going to be the Hilbert space of my spectral triple. I'm trying to make a spectral triple, obviously. Um, and this is the algebra of the spectral triple. But this isn't yet the Hilbert space. It's just a Hilbert space. Um, and obviously the inner product on the Hilbert space is... as usual, trace A star B. So here's a Hilbert space, this little h here, and uh, a two actions, two commuting actions of the algebra. And so h is a bimodule over the algebra. Bimodule. And what I'm going to do is give the uh, names to the elements of this uh, in this bimodule here. So, <coughs> so an element in the bimodule <laughs> can't reach. So psi and h. going to name the matrix elements like this. So 
So these are names of the fermions in the standard model in one generation. Okay, so that's in curly H. So this is, uh, lists all the fermion fields, distinguishing the left-handed fields and the right-handed ones, but ignoring the fact that they're spinners on space-time. This is just at a point and ignoring any spinner indices. Yes, a question. Yeah, I'll explain in a, in a minute, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Um, yes. So obviously I'm looking here at the neutrino left and right, the electron left and right, and the up and down quarks left and right, and they have three colours. So it's three, three quarks. Actually, the colours are usually called red, green, and blue. And the standard joke is that green is named after George Green, who's Nottingham's famous math mathematician. Okay. Um, so it's convenient to think of all the fields here as, as one mathematical object rather than separate fields. And if you want three generations, uh, let's just write here. So three generations, you can write you can write H tensor C three, which is obviously just the direct sum of three copies. So I'm not going to worry about the other generations most of the time, but they are in principle there. So there's a chirality operator. Um, obviously, you can. These are left-handed and these are right-handed, so um, so the chirality. No, this is this is these are the names for one generation of corp. Of, These are the three colours. Three colours. Quarks come in three colours. You have a, a red, green, and blue quark. That's that's one, two, and three. Yes. And then there's another three for the generations. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So the chirality operator is is matrix multiplication with with. Um, yeah, obviously you can write it like this. Lots, lots of zeros times uh, psi. Okay, so what's the gauge group? Yes. Is uh, one of the possible way for this some uh, principle that this by one and by two representations uh, selected? Yeah. How do we select this? That's a good question. Let me just just I'll come back to that point in a minute. Yes. Um, so what's the gauge group? So the gauge group. So there's an action of you. So there's an action. I think I'm going to use U for unitary elements, so this is U, U star and U inverse. Uh, row of U 
It's an adjoint action, which I've sort of used rho for in the past. So, so we simultaneously act on the left and the right, but obviously with u inverse on the right. So it's sort of an adjoint. And then you can read off irreducible representations of this group from that action. But as somebody was saying earlier, uh, this isn't quite right because the, the standard model gauge group is SU3. So what's, what's the fix? So the correct gauge group is um, So let's call these unitary elements in uh, U in big U. So I guess that's U. Uh, so there's a subgroup here, which is the subgroup determined by um, debt of pi 2 is 1. So you notice here that, that, so this is the matrix pi 2, and its determinant isn't uh, generally 1. So we go to the subgroup of unitaries where, where it is 1. Pi 1, in fact, already has determinant 1, because the quaternion has determinant 1, and the C and the C star cancel. If they're unitary, they're e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta, so multiply to 1. So, <clears throat> debt to pi 1 equals 1 anyway. So that's the gauge group. Um, and what does it do? Uh, I think I need another board. Um, This re removes the U1 that you, that you don't want, but in a very specific way. So, um, so I've got, if I've got M in um, U3, so that's a unitary element of, of M3C, then write it is T times S with S in SU3. So T is just whatever phase factor is left over. So uh, T is a new one, obviously. Then this condition here that determinant pi, pi 2 is 1 is um, uh, C times debt of M and debt of M is uh, T cubed. Because this has determinant one. So, um, <clears throat> so you can set, uh, you could set C to be T minus three. But in the physics literature, it, it's normal to use fractional charges. So you set, T to C minus one third. And eliminate T. And then what's left is the, so now G is isomorphic to uh, 
U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. Although it, it, you see, it's not it's not that you've just turned that into SU3. You haven't. That the that there's the U1 that survives is some combination of of the first and the last factor. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so an element of this is like that. Okay, and then this determinant here times that is, yeah, so that's, that's how it works. T equals. So then you can work out what the irreducible representations are and, um, and you get a table. I should try and draw here if I have enough room. So firstly, the left-handed neutrino and electrons. So you get a, a C inverse. And that's from the right action of of, uh, of of pi two, and obviously quaternion acts on the left here. That's the left action pi one, and then this is trivial here. And then there's you know the quarks, the left-handed quarks, all six of them come together. And you get, um, what do you get? Because they're left-handed, the pi one gives you a factor Q and uh, then the, there's an action here of, of M here, uh, but M is then split into uh, C minus the third S. So, but that's on the right and it comes inverted. So you have uh, S inverse here and T minus one, which is C to the one third here. And this is a right action, so I'm going to turn it into a left action by putting in a transpose. And you can carry on in this way and complete the table. I've put in a right-handed neutrino, so this isn't, notice here is the right-handed neutrino. So already we've sort of predicted a right-handed neutrino, one for each generation, because without it, the whole theory would be a complete mess. <laughs> Wouldn't be a matrix. Um, so, so there it is, and it comes completely uncharged. Uh, the right-handed electron And then there's the right-handed up quark. And the downs. And you get C to the four thirds here and C to the minus two thirds here. Again. And they're trivial here. So this, these come out to be the correct hypercharges for the fermions. 
if you've ever, if you ever taught this, you'll remember these patterns of four thirds and one thirds and minus two for the right-handed electron. Right-handed electron has twice the hypercharge for the left-hand left hand fermions, and so on. This is, comes out exactly right. This comes out to be the, the in fact, the complex conjugate representation, because S inverse transferred is, is the complex conjugate matrix. So these have actually come out to be the anti-fundamental of SE3, which doesn't matter. I could have just complex conjugated at the beginning, and it would have come out as the fundamental. So that's completely unimportant. The key thing is they're all the same, which is what you want. Okay, and so the important thing was this condition here. And this condition here is that gave us the right gauge group. It has a name, it's called the unimodular condition. Unimodular condition. Uh, mod, I can't spell, mod u la condition. A determinant being one is sort of unimodular in, in some mathematical framework. framework. So that's, that's the, where the name comes from. You might ask, well, supposing I didn't have this, what would happen? And I had the full, the bigger group as the gauge group, this one here. Well, the answer is your quantum field theory would have anomalies. So this condition here, this unimodular condition, is somehow uh, related to the vanishing of anomalies in uh, quantum field theory. So it's very necessary. Um, whether there's a good explanation of it in non-commutative geometry is a very good question. I mean, obviously this condition is, is reasonably straightforward and easy to understand. Um, it's not some horrible uh, thing. Um, so if you like, that's an explanation of it. But I think it'd be nicer to have a deeper explanation. I think that's, that's missing at the moment. But if you add in the quantum field theory, then perhaps that's maybe all the explanation you need. I don't know. <clears throat> so what's the point of this construction here so far? Well, I have to say this is, this is a very surprising result for the following reason, that um, algebras have very, very few representations. So uh, it's not true of groups. If you start with a, with a group, we're used to the fact that these Lie groups have an infinite set of representations. There's the trivial representation, there's fundamentals, there's sometimes the anti-fundamental, and you can tensor them all together and make. So if you just start with gauge groups, you can make all sorts of theories with all sorts of representations of the gauge groups. Um, and when you first meet the standard model, it looks like that's what's happened. Some things have uh, uh, no charges at all, like the right-handed neutrino. Some things have one, some things have two, and even these left-handed quarks seem to have three charges. And so there's no sort of pattern or reason for it. Um, but when you come to algebras, let's we'll start with this algebra here. The key observation is that algebras have very, very few representations. So uh, let's emphasize this by uh, writing it here. Very few representations. I mean, all you can do to make an irreducible representation is to represent one of the factors. So uh, irreducible representation, one of the factors is represented. And uh, for C, there are two representations, C or C star. That's it. That's the only representations of the algebra C that there are. And for H, there's only one representation which is on C2. 
So up to a unitary equivalence, there is no other representation. And for the three by three matrices, you can have um, C3, um, so this is by, by Q, obviously, and you can have the matrix M and you can have the complex conjugate matrix. And then again, that's it. Um, and uh, so this is on, let's see, these, these real algebras here. So that's it. There isn't even a fundamental, uh, sorry, a trivial representation. There's no trivial representation of you know, the quaternions. It's an algebra. It doesn't exist. So, so when somebody asks, well, how did you choose um, pi 1 and pi 2? Well, okay, there's a little bit of freedom here. I, could put in, I can put in any of these, these things and make blocks out of them. But then there's not many things you can do. There's only a very small number of different possibilities. Um, so out of that small number of possibilities, I have chosen some seemingly at random. Obviously, I want to get the standard model. But it's a very, very strong fact that um, all these standard model charges appear as a bimodule over an algebra. So, SM, so let's say this. SM charges from bimodule over algebra A. So that's, that's surprising. And it means, uh, and so there are, there's a huge array of different physics theories you might make which can't be done like this. Um, and it also means that if you want to extend physics and have beyond the standard model, new new fields and new couplings and things, it's very, very limited here as to what you could possibly do. You, there's a few extra things you could put together, but, but the number of things you can do is, is limited. Okay, so that's, that's the message from that. So there's an exercise for you to do as homework, which is to go through and complete this table here and check that the charges I've written here are correct. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm not going to go through the exercises from the last lecture, because if I do, we'll all miss lunch. So uh, I'm going to save you that. But if, if you want to know how they go, then please come and talk to me. Right. Um, so now I want to talk about, um, I'm on to the next chapter. <coughs> So that was, the last chapter was called Charges. This is called Masses. I want to make this into a spectral triple. So I kind of almost did it, but not quite. So I've now got relativistic length contraction on my piece of chalk. Okay. The faster you write, the more it shrinks. So the problem with this construction is that this uh, Hilbert space doesn't have a real structure. And from what I said in the previous lectures, this real structure is a really important ingredient in the whole thing. Um, and the other thing that's uh, important from the point of view of quantum field theory is it's kind of assuming that all the fields are complex fields here. 
And when we write down the Dirac action or something, you assume it's a complex field and you're happy. But as soon as you write down a Majorana mass term, then this all becomes unstuck because the Majorana mass term is not, is not uh, sesquilinear in the fields. And then you have to write some other thing and you start, suddenly start to realize that your Dirac operator isn't uh, complex linear anymore and so on. So uh, for those two reasons, I'm going to extend the Hilbert space um, and uh, to make a real structure. And that also, as a result, allows us to have Majorana mass terms. OK. Uh, so the spectral triple is going to have dimension six. <coughs> the KO dimension six, mod eight. Um, and the Hilbert space for one generation the sub one is just one generation there uh, you have two sets of matrices so you just double up but actually I'm going to arrange them inside 8 by 8 matrices in the following way that psi in there is, is an off-diagonal block matrix with psi. So psi is the original, is this thing here. And then there's a, another thing called psi bar. So, so this is capital psi. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So psi and psi bar are independent four by four matrices. So this uh, is obviously um, isomorphic to C, C32, dimension 32. And the, the algebra action I want to package into uh, pi of A. And I'm going to put both my blocks, pi 1 and pi 2, together in a, in a block diagonal matrix here. So, so when I write a dot, that's a very small zero. Okay, so that these things are empty here. <clears throat> so that's the action of A. That's the, the left action on the Hilbert space. Well, that's a matrix. And then the left action uh, of an algebra element on this thing is the matrix multiplication. I probably ought to have a dot or something for matrix multiplication. So that's matrix multiplication. And the right action is, is, the, is the, the right matrix multiplication. by the same thing. And then you can check that they're intertwined by Hermitian conjugation. So, so J hmm, is going to disappear. So J H1 to H1 uh, J is is just star, which is emission conjugation. So perhaps that goes here now. Okay. I'm going to rub out this table here, which I might regret later. We can all remember it, right? So now you can check, this is an exercise, that uh, the right action of A is J, left action of A star, J inverse. 
So that's, that's an exercise you should do. So this is now obeys the right axioms for a spectral triple. So obviously J here uh, is this antilinear operation that takes the fields that we know already, the psi's in the top uh, right block, into fields the psi bars in the bottom left block. And it obviously it picks up that matrix and flips it on its side by emission conjugation. So that gives us names for psi bar. So psi bar is this matrix, and it's the same as that, but written on its side. And to make the names different, I'm going to put bars on them. Uh, so this is up left one and so on filling in like, like that and likewise you can write a carality operator where chi is this 4x4 four four matrix, which I wrote here. And you can see by just multiplying out that this keeps the left-handed fields unchanged and the right-handed ones get a minus sign. Okay. So just a piece of bookkeeping. And then you can check that... Um, J gamma is minus gamma J. <clears throat> In fact, that's kind of trivial because, uh, well, yeah, this turns into that, but with a minus sign. And obviously you have J squared is one because J is emission conjugation. And this is what we mean by KO dimension S equals six at least before considering the Dirac operator. So interestingly, this spectral triple for the finite internal space has, algebraically, has dimension six. So it's just like in, in uh, includes a Klein theory where the favorite internal spaces are six manifolds. So, and it's for the same reason, because these the spinners and so on have the right properties. But here we see it um, from the construction. Okay. Just a historical aside, um, this construction here um, emerged in around 2006. Um, and there was an earlier construction in, uh, due to Alan Conn in 1995, which had, which was almost the same as, as what I've outlined, but it had the S equals naught. And it turned out to be sort of a mistake, but a subtle mistake. In fact, it was the wrong assignment of a chirality operator. Um, and it took a long time is sort of psychologically to understand that a finite dimensional spectral triple could be anything other than dimension zero. Because if you think of it as a sort of manifold, 
you know, a finite set of points can have a finite Hilbert space, you know, because the spinners or the functions on a finite set of points is a finite dimensional space. So you might think that anything that comes along with a finite dimensional Hilbert space or finite dimensional algebra has to be KO dimension zero, but that was wrong. So that sort of conceptual mistake took around 10 years to correct. Okay, but so this minus sign here historically is very important. Okay. So now what about the Dirac operator? <clears throat> Talk about the Dirac operator. Now, as a fundamental result, that for any finite spectral triple. So in other words, dim h less than dim h finite. Um, you can split the Dirac into the sum of two pieces. Such that um, the, the piece labeled right commutes with the right action and the piece labeled left commutes with the left action. Uh, and when you do that, then the, the first order condition is satisfied. First order axiom. Remember the first order axiom is that if you commute with the left action and then you commute again with the right action, you get zero. Well, obviously, if you commute with the left action, this thing vanishes straight away. And then if you commute with the right action, uh, with the left action, you get something there, but if you commute with the right action, again, you get zero. Because you can do the commutations in either order. So you can do it. So this, this is, um, satisfies that axiom trivially and um, uh, can choose. Uh, so you can choose this and you can have each piece to be self-adjoint and um, commutes or anti-commutes with the chirality as required. This is S even, S odd. And does the right thing with the but that's it. That's all the conditions. And you see the... Um, oh, no, I see. No, that is a condition, right? Yes, there is another condition. So the left piece is just obtained by flipping left to right. So conjugation with J and J inverse flips flips left to right, so just interchanges these two pieces over. So they're not independent. Independent. Um, and because of this, you know, D left satisfies these conditions as well. So all you have to do is, is construct one of them and then the other piece comes for free. 
So I'm going to write down uh, construction for DR. And it's a little bit involved, but not too terrible. Where shall I go? Right. Mm. Do I need that board? Well, I might. Yeah, I'm going to need that board. Okay, let's take this one. Oh, so, so we're going to construct DR. So DR is the sum of terms, finite sum of terms, of the form M psi P. And um, So this is, uh, again, matrix multiplication. Uh, on the left and the right. <coughs> so P um, commutes with the right action. And M changes correlity. So you see, you know, P is, is multiplying on the right. So that's where the right action comes in. The right action comes in as a matrix here. So if I want this whole thing to commute with the right action, this matrix P, I better commute with the right action. This doesn't matter. Okay, so that guarantees you um, this this property here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and this thing here, that's where the chirality. Remember, for the matrix. Um, well, yeah, uh, right. Well, we'll see that, that this, this thing here changes the chirality and that guarantees that, uh, that this, this thing is satisfied. And obviously I'll have S even for the, the standard model. Right. Uh, so here's one term. So um, so I write P Q P sub Q. So it's an eight by eight matrix here. So there's a five by five zero, and then a three by three unit matrix. And then if I, um, so I'm going to compute psi p just to see where we're up to. This selects out um, parts of the upper right block. So you get something like this. Those are all zeros. And then here I have the quarks. Up left one. Of course, there's not enough room to write. That was predictable. Let's do the writing first.
They're all zeros there. Okay, so that's the effect of right multiplying by this matrix. It just selects out these, these non-zero entries. And then the M matrix here for this thing is, um, is the following thing. Well, I want this to flip chirality, so I do an off-diagonal thing here with, with two by two matrices. And I want this to be Hermitian, so that's the Hermitian conjugate, and these are all zero. So NQ is two by two. Okay. So what that gives me is um, <clears throat> okay. Let's assume I don't need this part. So I'm doing this very, very much detail. So this piece dr. And I shall stop doing the other, the other bits. So left multiplying by this just swaps over the left and right, you see, and, and multiplies them by this matrix. So I end up with this thing. So these are zeros, and then I have here n four, four, four dots, zeros. Then here you have n q times the the right-handed things. Same there, and then NQ star with the left-handed things. Similar pattern. So what is this? What, what's it done here is it's picked up the, the quarks, it's swapped them over and it's multiplied them by a matrix that doesn't depend on the color charge. So what do we call that? In a Dirac operator. Okay, so this is a mass term for the quarks. Okay, it's exactly what the mass term is. And the NQ is a mass matrix. And the uh, eigenvalue the uh, masses of the up and the down quarks. So the eigenvalues, standard model theory, are masses. So we normally assume that these, you've chosen the basis to diagonalize these. So they're just some diagonal constant times this or a constant times that, different constant. Okay, and then you can go through and work out other terms like this. You can get uh, also mass terms for leptons. as a separate term, so they're not related. And you can get, interestingly, you can get a Majorana mass term. Mass term. Um, and related fields. Uh, 
And this is this rather interestingly as a map, for example, uh, new R or ER matrix that maps those to um, new bar R or the up corks, right-handed up corks. So this is uh, important because it allows the, the new to new R is the Majorana mass term. Is the, is the Majorana mass term. And that's highly desirable. I mean, if you don't have such a thing, it's very hard to gener generate masses for the neutrinos in a physically realistic way. Well, we couldn't do it in this theory because you can't, remember, you can't just add in other terms that you feel like it. They've got to fit in this framework. And this framework dictates very few terms. But the Majorana mass term is there. And of course, there's a Dirac mass term, so you can have a seesaw mechanism. For neutrino masses. So that's, that's great. The theory also allows you to couple other things like the right-handed electron and with this neutrino or with the uh, right-handed quarks. And that's bad, you don't want that. Um, so it seems that the theory has a bit too much freedom in it. It allows things that you don't want, but of course you can set them to zero. So, that, so those have to be set to zero. And they're called um, lepto quarks, which we don't want. And we must set them to zero, or else. So the non commutative geometry is perfectly compatible with lepto quarks being zero. That's these bad couplings, but it doesn't explain it. So if you like, the theory is still a bit too weak to explain that, that little corner of the standard model. Okay. So what I want to do is form the product geometry. <clears throat> that was a product of spectral triples. And <clears throat> this is called the vacuum of the standard model. Or a vacuum of the standard model. And uh, you see, generally, if you have two spaces, two manifolds or something, and you take the product of the manifolds, you, there are Riemannian metrics on them that are the product metric. You have metric on that and metric on that and the product metric. But not all metrics on a product space have to be the product metric. There's plenty of other metrics that are not the product. So. You know, when things start to interact or fluctuate, if you like, then you see off-diagonal terms. And as we saw in the Klutz Klein, the off-diagonal terms in the original Klutz Klein were interpreted as the gauge field, as a U1 gauge field. You know, the components G mu five, where mu is one to four, were were the potentials for a U1 gauge field. So. Um, so you expect that the product geometry wouldn't have any gauge fields. In fact, that's how it works. So gauge fields. Okay, so I want to describe the product first and then I'll talk about the fluctuations away from the product which give you the gauge fields. So that's why it's called fluctuations. Now in my notes, I've got some some detail about products in general. If you have two spectral triples, you can form a product of them, have a product spectral triple. 
Um, so I'm not going to discuss the general detail, but I'll come to the particular point in mind. So, um, so we make the product here. So we've got the space-time manifold is a spectral triple with its usual space-time Dirac operator. And with the internal space I've been describing in the last hour or so. So the product here, the total algebra is the algebra for the space-time tensored with the algebra for the finite thing. And now the space-time and the finite space have these little subscripts so we remember which is which. And of course, the algebra for space-time is just functions on space-time. Uh, in fact, real functions on space-time here because all my algebras are real. And here, this is some matrices. So when I tense the two together, I have smooth maps from the space-time to the matrices of the finite spectral triple. So basically, I get matrices that vary from point to point. And the Hilbert space is, again, the tensor product. And again, you can describe this as L2 sections over the manifold of the spinner bundle tensored with the finite Hilbert space. So what's in here? Well, the, the sections in here are sections that vary from point to point, and there's a comp there are matrices which are also spinners on space-time. So if you like, what we've done here is in these um, matrices here. Remember the the actual uh, Hilbert space of the one generation is this and a load of other stuff. And then the duals here, uh, conjugates. So what we've done is we've now promoted these to be functions of space-time, and they're now spinner fields. Okay, that's what's in this thing here. And it's, it's kind of too much um, because, you know, remember in here, um, these are the Dirac spinners. So actually we've overcounted the degrees of freedom here because now our left-handed spinner, left-handed field for the neutrino will come with a whole Dirac spinner and the right-handed field for the neutrino will come with a whole Dirac spinner, which is embarrassing. I only want the left-handed spinners for those and the right-handed spinners for those. So in actual fact, to, to get to the physical subspace, um, we have to go to a chiral subspace. H plus in H. And, um, what, and basically I want the, the chiralities to match. I want the chirality of the name here of the field to match the chirality of the spinner. So I want that um, the manifold chirality tends to the um, internal space chirality have the same eigenvalue. So they're either both plus one or they're both minus one. That's what I want to achieve. So they're both left-handed or right-handed. So that means overall the eigenvalue of this thing here must be one. Okay, so the chirality operator for this product is in fact, as I've written there, So we can write this equation just simply as being the uh, total chirality of the thing. So this, 
So this is the physical fields. So you might think, can't I just have um, the H plus here in the spectral triple and be done with it and not bother with H? Well, no, you can't, because the point of that, the Dirac operator, is it maps um, left-handed things to right-handed things. So the Dirac operator will always map H plus to H minus. And that's, you know, that's endemic in, in chiral physics. You know, you can't get away from that. Um, but, but in the action, by the time you've sandwiched this, this Dirac operator into a fermion action, the H minus never appears. It gets you in a product with something that's also in H minus, and then the result is a function on H plus only. So, so in the spectral triple, we have this extra degrees of freedom so that we can have a Dirac operator, uh, but it doesn't mean that they're physical degrees of freedom. Okay. So that's physical fields in the action. Okay, so that's that. And then I want the Dirac operator, which I want to write on the bottom, but I guess I can't reach. Let's put it here. Yes, Dirac operator is it's basically the sum of the two Dirac operators, but with a twist. So you take the Dirac on the manifold tensor with the unit operator on the internal space and then the chirality on the manifold tensor with the Dirac on the internal space. Let's write that better. So you might ask, well, what's this chirality doing here? Can't I just replace this with the unit operator? The answer is no, you can't, because then the dm and the df bits would, would commute, and that's bad. So the purpose of this is so that the, this part here anti-commutes with this part here, which is good. So if you think in terms of products of manifolds, that's actually what you expect. If you just had two manifolds and two commutative Dirac operators, there'd be some gamma matrices in here and some gamma matrices in here, and you don't get gamma matrices for the whole thing by getting the two gamma matrices to commute. Gamma matrices have to anti-commute. So this, this putting in you know, this tensor, a gamma matrix, will make it anti-commute with the gamma matrices in here. So it's a completely natural thing. And this construction also happens in gamma matrices if you try and make products of gamma matrices. Okay, and there's a bit more about it in my notes. Okay, and then the final thing which I've not left space for, is the real structure. Let's put that up here. This is the vacuum. So the real structure is just the tensor product of real structures. There's lots of checking to do to check that this does give you a spectral triple. So, so check it's a spectral triple. There's various axioms to check. Particularly important to check the algebraic ones. Okay, so that's that. Just as a side note, this... Um, even this H plus here still contains fields and their conjugate fields. That's completely fine. When we do uh, physics, we do functional integral over complex fields. Actually, the way you define it is by integrating over the fields and their complex conjugates. So the fact that they both appear in the formalism is actually good. That's actually what you want when you define. So it's like, you know, in, in uh, integrating over the complex plane, you write dz z bar um, because you know, that's a way of doing it. so so in 
a functional integral, you'd write integral over these fields and integral over the conjugate fields. Okay. So now I want to talk about the gauge field. So this is the, the product geometry, which, as I say, is like a vacuum, and there are no gauge fields in this. So now I want to talk about gauge fields. Oh, I forgot. I want to put a zero on here. Uh, if you can, I hope you can see that, to indicate that it's the vacuum Dirac operator. I mean, in a minute, I want more general operators than just D naught. So this is the product geometry. D naught. Okay. So how do we do this? So omega. is a set of uh, operators, so bounded operators, on the Hilbert space. And each omega, little omega is each element is a sum, a finite sum, of left action of algebra elements times a commutator with d naught of uh, right actions. Sorry, of uh, another left action. Excuse me. So an important part of the axiomatics for a commutative manifold, which I actually skipped uh, whenever it was last lecture, is that this is a bounded operator. So that's always, always true. So the whole thing is bounded because the algebra acts as bounded operators. So that's good. Um, and what you should think of is that this is this commutator with D is like a derivative operator. So it's sort of like um, um, some sort of derivative operator. In fact, this is what it would be on a, on a, in a commutative space, and then with some gamma matrices. So something like this. That's kind of what you should be thinking here, that this commutator with a Dirac is like, it's the, it's the analog of it's not exactly equal to, but it's the analog in the commutative world of this formula like this. So indeed, these are um, what you might call slashed one forms. That you, you, for the covariant derivative, you make a one form. Well, these are all the gradients here, but, but then multiplied by arbitrary functions, you have the arbitrary one forms, and now you turn them into operators on the spinners by using the gamma matrices. So that's sort of what you should be thinking of when you see this formula. Although there's considerably more general stuff in here than in that little sketch. So I've got my, this set. Uh, uh, so what can we say about this? So um, omega is, in fact, a bimodule. Over A. So you can act uh, on the left. You, well, you can act with LA. So omega, LA, and... L, let's call it something else, C and LD. That's also in omega. So a little calculation to see that that's true. It's obviously true for this one here, 
just changes this. But for this one here, you need to fiddle around with commutators and things. Okay. So what do we do with them? So if we take a self-adjoint element, in this bimodule, um, we can then adjust our vacuum Dirac operator. So we take d is d naught plus omega. Like this. And this, um, so this is called the, the fluctuation of d, of d naught. Fluctuation of d naught by by omega, and you can check again that it's also a Dirac operator. So this this by construction here commutes with the right action. So that piece will satisfy the first order condition. And this here, because J interchanges left and right, this has a similar formula but with right actions in it and will commute with the left action. So this will be something like no, R, A, now I'm doing soft a cuff, something like this. Now, I may, I, I may get that wrong, but anyway, you, you can work out what the formula is in terms of the right action. To write the wrong thing. Okay, there's a page missing somewhere. Oh. So we're on the board, yeah. So now a gauge transformation. So this is a unitary element in the algebra. And then it acts, you have the adjoint action. Row of U. So the left action of U and the right action of U inverse or U star. And then we're going to throw in the mysterious modularity condition. Sorry, unimodular condition. So debt. Of the left action of U at any point X is equal to one. So remember the algebra is just uh, make is just space-time dependent matrices. So I can look at the um, the matrix at any point and its left action and, and that determinant has to be one. Okay. So without this, we get slightly too big gauge transformations and anomalies in the quantum theory. Anyway, so there we are. Um, so now for any unitary operator, you 
you can define a new Dirac operator just by conjugation with u. So obviously that's a transformation of a Dirac operator into another one, as long as the unitary satisfies enough reasonable conditions. But anyway, let's suppose it does, so that's a new thing. And then you can write this uh, by this slightly crazy looking formula, but it's the original Dirac plus u times the the commutator with u inverse. So obviously you can do in your head, but let's just do it here. This this thing here is u d u inverse minus u inverse d, and then you see here that u and u inverse cancel, and the d cancels that, and so you're just left with with this. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So this is a rather crazy way of writing this, this conjugation form there. But it, but it emphasizes that this piece here is what we call the fluctuation. So this is now a fluctuation by gauge transformation um, by, or by this operator U, in fact, here. So now apply this to this adjoint thing here. Ah, no, I can't do that. So uh, d prime minus d. So it's just this term here. So just rewriting it, it's rho of u commutator of d with rho of u star. Um, and then you can expand using the fact that rho is a left and a right thing and you have two terms. Um, so you can write it in the following way. You get left u d left u star plus right U star D right U Okay, so how am I doing? So now I want to plug in this formula here. So, so bring us back to D naught. And if I can do that on the bottom there. Um, I'm going to write it as D naught plus omega prime plus J prime J inverse. So obviously this part is going to be part of omega prime and this is going to be part of, sorry, that's omega prime. This is going to be part of the, this is the sort of left acting piece and this is going to be the right part of the right acting piece. Okay, so then you need to unravel that and work out what omega prime is on a board coming up soon here. Yep. So this is what you get.
Okay, so that's um, <clears throat> putting in the omega that belongs to this and this term. And now I substitute in D for its expression and I will get D naught. Then I can simplify this in the same way that that little calculation happened. It's just this. This cancels one of the terms here, obviously, and just leaving me with that. And you recognize this uh, as looking like the transformation law for a gauge potential under a gauge transformation. This is the derivative term here, and this is the homogeneous term where you just transform by gauge transformation the connection. Yes. But it's more, there's more to it, there's more in it than that. Um, because D naught isn't just a space time thing, this isn't just a derivative but it's got the finite piece in as well. So I can substitute that in. For my vacuum operator. Now this is exactly the, this term and this term together are exactly the gauge transformation, these are the gauge transformation of a one form of connection. Um, and this, this term here, this is something new. So in actual fact, our um, fluctuations you could split into two parts here, right up here. Do the same trick on the whole fluctuation here. I can put in D naught uh, in my formula for D naught, which has disappeared. Anyway, in the same way, there's two pieces. There's the manifold and the finite. And then you have the gauge fields. And the, the bit with the finite is the Higgs fields. So we can split so split omega to gauge fields. That's the manifold part. Well, I can write it this way. Just quickly. Omega M plus omega F. And the gram is the gauge fields. And omega F is the Higgs. So 
So what is the Higgs? Well, let's just sort of look at this. This is inessential. That's just chirality on the manifold. This thing here basically is um, conjugating the, the finite Dirac operator. So it's saying the gauge transformations act on the finite Dirac operator. Well, we thought the finite Dirac operator was just a matrix of constants telling me the masses of all the, all the fermions. But no, some of them are charged, so there's a non-trivial action on some of those. And the constants that transform under this gauge thing are, of course, Higgs fields. That's the whole point of Higgs fields, that when you add Dirac mass terms, you're not allowed to just add Dirac mass terms in a gauge theory because some of them are charged under the gauge group and they move as you, as you gauge transform. And those are exactly the Higgs fields. So the Higgs fields are contained in, in, the, in the fluctuations. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the, the vacuum operator D0 already has vacuum Higgs fields, which are of course constants. Those are the constants we put in, in the, for the mass terms. But then when I apply the um, gauge transformations, those constants vary and they become Higgs fields. So some of these constants uh, remain as constants. The things that are uncharged under the gauge groups, but the things that have charge become the Higgs fields. And you can check that the charges of the Higgs fields are exactly what they should be. Okay, so I think it's lunchtime, yes. Um, that's it. So in summary, uh, you know, the, this whole theory fits the standard model very well. There's one or two places where the theory isn't tight enough and the standard model obeys some extra restrictions that we don't seem to have. So that's sort of interesting. You know, it says, you know, you can perhaps tweak the theory. And there is an industry of people embellishing the, the, the non-commutative geometry to add extra things to it, to, to hope to nail down these, these things that are still... Um, slightly too general in the presentation I've given here. But it's perfectly consistent with it, and it's only consistent with a few extensions. For example, you can have uh, an extra U1 that couples to B minus L is allowed in this framework. So that's interesting. Um, you can have, by ditching one of the axioms, you can have patty salam unification. And the status of that is interesting. I don't know how happy I am to ditch one of the axioms, but you can do that. Um, you cannot get um, SE5 unification. So, you know, there's quite a lot of predictive power here and it's quite constrained. Um, and there's an interesting question as to just what extra structures possibly we need to really nail down high energy physics precisely. Okay, so I'll stop. No, I mean, it tells you about the geometry of the fields and the structure of the action and the allowed terms and so on in the action. And there's a very nice formulas for the action um, called the spectral action. In fact, surprisingly, the boson action just depends on the eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, which is incredible, in fact. Um, but it doesn't tell you how to do quantum field theory. Um, so you can do quantum field theory in your own preferred way. But I think there's a very interesting question as to how do the structures of non commutative geometry play with the structures of, non of quantum field theory. Um, for example, the, the, the role of the unimodularity condition and anomalies is, is, a, is a great starting point. Uh, and there's various other places of contact. So for example, you know, what happens when you renormalize? What happens to the all the stuff in here? You know, what, what which of this is preserved by a renormalization flow is a, is a very good question. But no, it doesn't tell you how what quantum field theory is. Yeah. 